Well, welcome to part two of night sailing. <laughs> My job today is to edit out the video, which I hope you're watching right now. So we're here in Bangor. I'm not flying the drone at the start of this episode because if I did, I think the drone would be gone. I don't think you'd see it anymore. We had a Force 11 the other day and we're currently getting gusty at eight and we're expecting a Force 10 this evening. So I think we'll clear the drone and be gone for capes. So this episode is gonna concentrate on the main parts of the passage and what to do when you finally get into your port of destination and you're closing in on it. I hope you enjoy it. And remember, comments or questions, just leave them below. Okay, so the passage itself. Um, ideally, your passage will be the simplest part. You always try and plan to have the bulk of the night passage in the area with the least to do, the least hazards, the uh, least work, the least shipping. You know, if you can manage it, plan it that way. It won't always work out that way, but do try your best to plan it that way. Give yourself as little to do at night. I know that sounds boring, but you don't want surprises when you can't see where you're going. So, for instance, when Beverly and I planned the passage to go from Arklow to Carnarvon, mm -hmm. um, there was a section of overflow for, for falls in the middle. Now, we basically wanted to get past those in the twilight area. Mm. Um, you know, I wanted to be able to see the overfall so I could navigate through them in the best way possible. And once we were through them, it was clear water the rest of the way to Carnarvon. So we made sure we did the overfall section in at least twilight. We left early enough and took a foul tide to actually do that. When you're sort of like moving from twilight to, to, to full night, it, it brings us on to a slightly more controversial topic, which is night lights in the cabin. Should they be red or should they be white? Now, long-standing wisdom is you use red lights because they don't destroy your night vision. However, I have also read um, reports from people who say that it's not the colour of the light, it's the intensity of the light. The red lights tend to be less intense, therefore they're dimmer, therefore they've got less effect on your eyes. And that um, I've seen other recommendations that you should be using dim white lights. Uh, now on this boat, we use dim white lights, not because we're trying to keep up with the latest recommendation, but because we haven't got any red ones on board. We did actually, what we did was yeah, we but... actually put, we cut out a circle of red and put it into one of the lights and it melted. So we're back to white light. <laughs> So once you're under passage and um, it's starting to get darker and darker and night is about to fall, it's generally considered good sailing practice to reef down the sails. If you've got full sail up, put a reef or two in, um, it will slow your passage. Um, hopefully you plan for that in advance. But also if the wind does get up or anything like that happens, you've got less sail up and so the boat will be easier to handle. The main reason that we do that is during the night, uh, Beverly and I uh, do a watch mm. um, so that one person is in the cockpit monitoring the systems and keeping um, the watch on, whereas the other person is on a passage bunk. They might not be sleeping, but at least having A, a warm mm -hmm. and B, a rest. Mm -hmm. Um, just so that they can have an hour or two hours of just sort of like putting the head down for a I bit. Think, I think generally we tend to rotate uh, roughly each hour or two hours if it's very benign. Mm. Yeah. Um, I know the old Navy system was four hours on watch, four hours off watch, but there's only two of us. It was a small boat. So um, we generally just take it an hour about. And um, I think it's usually about two, but certainly no longer than two. And mm. also... If there's nothing much going on upstairs, if it's a quiet passage and the boat's being well behaved and the sea's not kicking off, sometimes whoever's up here on watch might come down, put the kettle on, make a cup of tea. They're down below decks just for a few minutes. It just gets them out of the breeze for a bit and then they can come back up. Maybe you can swap watches. If the person down below is not feeling particularly sleepy, they'll put the cup on. But, you know, there's got to be some movement. You just can't sit here staring into a black wall all night. It's just, you just go out barking mad if you try that. So eventually the passage will come to an end and it'll come to an end in two ways. It will either come to an end in darkness or it'll come to an end in light. That's your choice. 
If it comes in engine light, it's just normal sailing, so we'll put that to one side and we'll talk about what to do when you arrive in the dark. Now, just before you arrive, um, that is where you start getting into what we call our danger zone. Um, because we're cl coming closer in and this is where the pots start to appear. <laughs> They're usually in shallower water. As we approach, we always like to be both um, up and awake at that time, mm -hmm. so that one person is doing nothing else but scanning um, the sea for pots and other things. So one of the pieces of equipment we have for that is a torch. But this is extremely useful for coming in and looking for boys, isn't it? It, it is, but especially pots, uh, because uh, by scanning, you can look for the shadows and stuff like that. Uh, you will find actually that at night, your night vision, once it's adapted down, is surprisingly good, unless you've got some sort of eye defect. But for most people, you, you will actually be surprised by just how much you can see in total darkness. It's not really totally dark unless there's a massive cloud over. Even if there's only stars up there, they actually provide a, a surprising amount of light to see by. And the other night, um, we saw Jupiter rise over the horizon and it actually had a trail of light on the water right up to the planet. I mean, one... that was because it was particularly clear. <laughs> It was a clear night, but that's what I'm saying. Once your once your vision adapts, mm. you you can see a surprising amount of stuff in the, in the and what you actually wind up looking for is dark shapes that don't give light out, things that get in the way of it, and that's how you see the boys, um, the unlit ones. They are dark shadows, and you can see those shadows at night. And you wouldn't think you'd see shadows at night, but you can do. Mm. It's surprising. But having said all that, your eyes are good, but there is nothing like extending your eyes, and getting a pair of decent binoculars. Now, the thing to look for in binoculars you're going to use at night is the width of this lens. Forget about the magnification. These are 7x50s. Wouldn't matter if they were 10x50s or 20x50s. It's the 50 that counts, the width of the lens, because this is what gathers the light. Compare the size of that to the size of the pupil of your eye, and you can see how much more light is going to go into this. Um, these will show things up at night that your eye can barely see. A pair like this, which obviously we have on board, is useless at night. This is absolutely useless. These, okay, they're bigger than your eyes, but not by a massive amount. Um, the optics in this isn't in particularly brilliant, but the image these produce is rather dim. The image these produce is much brighter. So get yourself a decent pair of boat binoculars, and if you can, get ones with an illuminated compass in them too. That is so useful. Uh, now, unfortunately for us, our battery, we need to get a new battery for our um, compass because you do need the light at night. Mm -hmm. But because our battery light has gone, then we were using our handheld compass. And um, what we did was we charged it up because it has a um, luminescent dial. Yep. We just charged it up and then we used this. Um, <coughs> to do the bearings. Yeah, it has an infinity prism on it, so you, with glasses your eye, you can just put it up and you can get the bearing off it. And because the lumin, because this is luminous, the dial is luminous, um, you can read the bearing off it even in darkness. So that was our standby, and that's what we had to use because, like I say, until we get some batteries, the illuminated dial on the compass uh, and the binoculars is out. So mm. that's another useful piece of equipment for coming in at night. As you approach, the end of your passage and you're using your binoculars and you're using your um, compass and you're maybe swinging your headlight on a stick around. Um, you need to be looking out for the voyage that you studied earlier. When I said familiarise yourself with the approaches, um, this is when you start doing it. Um, paper charts are more useful than electronic charts. I know that's controversial but it's the way it is. On a paper chart, they actually put beside the voyage its characteristics, including how far away you can see it from. Whereas in electronic charts, you have to touch the thing, go to a menu, dial down, pull up its characteristics and look at the property. But if you have something like reeds or a paper chart, it will actually say, this is a green light. It is three meters above the surface of the sea. It can be seen from six nautical miles away. 
The light beside it is a red light. It's five meters above the scene, can be seen from 10 nautical miles away. Then you know you're gonna see the red before you see the green because it's written on the chart. One time, um, the electronic chart really, really confused me because um, they'd got uh, two cardinals um, on the chart and I could not see these for love and money. Whereas I could see another um, light which was on the layer down <laughs> you know you had to zoom in mm. to see the markings of the light was there but i could see that first because it was taller it was, it was um it was 20 meters high it's the height it of was our... it was exactly it was 20 meters above the sea level so no wonder i could see it it's the height of our mouth exactly whereas the cardinals were just ordinary little lateral boy things about a metre maybe at most <laughs> above the sea level so I couldn't see those but it's just that be aware that if you are losing an electronic chart to dial in and dial out because sometimes they have markings and things like that closer in that you need to be aware of also when you're coming in have a strategy um, when we were going a few a few days back and we um, missed our sunset and we arrived after dark. Our plan had been to anchor, but it was an anchorage that we would have had to maneuver around through a mooring field and all the rest of it. First, we would have been anchoring in the dark, which gives the deck crew a lot of work to do uh, because you've got chains and anchors and heavy things and electric winches. It's not something really you want to be doing in, in, in darkness, to be quite honest. Um, even having the deck light on, the deck light's behind you, so this will all be happening in your shadow. So. We decided to take the portable headlight and we shone it around for a bit until we found some mirroring balls and they had retro tape on them which reflects the light straight back where it came from. <laughs> <laughs> which was a real, really useful. It was good, wasn't it? It was. And we just modified our plan there and then we simply went to the nearest mirroring ball, picked it up, and that was it, we were secured. So ch change of plan on that one. But as we were approaching, because uh, we had looked at the lights and knew what lights uh, were going to be uh, available, uh, there was a particular, there was a North Cardinal. Now, the, as we approached, we found that the North Cardinal was not lit. Yeah. But there were two East Cardinals and they both were lit. Well lit. Um, so we geared our passage on the East Cardinals because we could see them. And because we had also looked at the uh, anchorage, the area, the port before we came in, we knew that if we stayed reasonably close to two of these Cardinals, we were quite safe for an approach to the mirroring field. I didn't need to go and look that up. That was already in the head. Hmm. Um, Another thing that you need to know uh, when you're approaching uh, a marina, for instance, or a harbour or something like that, is what leading lines there are. Mm. Now, leading lines, I find, are particularly uh, useful to see. Um, and sectors lights, we, again, have a strategy on those. We do, don't we? Um, and our strategy is to basically always come from the red side. Yes, so we can we come from the red side because what we find is the transition from red to white goes red, pink, white very quickly and you can tell you're in the white sector. Whereas coming the other way, it's green, then it's a slightly paler green, then it's sort of like a yellowy green, then it's sort of like a yellowy with green tinges, then and, it sort of starts to go apple white. Apple green as and then well. you get apple green, and then finally you get to white. And it seems to take a lot longer in the green. Yeah, sector. the bleed, what we call the bleed, bleed between the two colours is just wider. Whereas the bleed from the red to white is a bit shorter. So that's why we have a tendency to go from the red side to the white side if we're going to go on a sectored light. Generally, yes. We have fitted um, additional lights and we've have fitted a locker light so that when we come in, we've got extra light to find equipment. It might be that we need to find fenders or Mr. Swifty uh, if we're going to go to a mooring or something like that, but we've got extra light where we need it. Also, as soon as the crew starts moving around on the deck, um, once once you're in, you're at the end of the passage, your night vision is now less important. Turn on the deck light if you have one. Uh, but it's more important the crew can move about the deck safely 
than preserving their night vision so they trip over something and fall overboard. That's just not going to help. One of the things to keep an eye out for is other boats. Um, other boats will have their navigation lights on, just like you should have your navigation lights on. But it's a good idea to be able to recognise the, the, what their navigation lights are for. How can you tell a fishing boat from a container and the rest of it? One of the things that we have on uh, board is a little cockpit companion. And if for some bizarre reason um, we don't actually know what that particular light means or something like that, then we can just pick it up, have a quick ganders and just sort of like... Um, check them out and just sort of like ah oh, right okay a, a boat that's towing um uh, another thing which is quite close to it is different from a boat that's towing something behind it 200 meters away and they'll have different light patterns for that but there's not something you're going to come across very often mm. yeah so it's it's worth having one of these little companions handy because it's a bit like driving i suppose you know most of the road signs you see in a regular day but occasionally you'll come across an oddball and you'll wonder what's that exactly passages a lot of it is about preparation uh, planning what you're gonna to have to do at the start planning what you're gonna to have to do in the middle planning what you're gonna to have to do at the end and knowing what you're gonna to have to do and say when it is dark always make sure that the tricky bits um, rip tides um, entrances things like that if you can try and get those bits in the daylight hours and the boring bits in the night time. I know it doesn't always work out like that, but if you can plan for it that way, do so. Mm -hmm. uh, have your crew prepared, have somewhere for them to sleep if they get tired, have food uh, or pre-made if you can do it. Alter the crew who's on watch on a regular basis because getting cold and getting tired is not good. Make sure that your boat is prepared uh, for sailing at night. For instance, make sure you've got the right lights. Um, and if you are sailing, reef down so that your passage is a little bit easier and is a little bit less stressful. Mm -hmm. Make sure you have the right equipment. Make sure you've got decent binoculars, um, a good torch of some description or other, and possibly something like an illuminated compass. Um, Always make sure that your crew is in decent clothes, that they are well prepared for some really, really cold conditions. And if you can, put the spray hood up because it <laughs> shelters everything you need on a night passage. <laughs> so we hope you enjoyed that and we hope you found it useful. Um, please do leave any questions down in the comment section below and we will endeavour to answer any that you've got in case we missed something. And um, always make, you know, if you do have questions, then do ask them. Um, these um, talks are here for you to um, find out more. So with that, I think we're going to get on with a few little jobs that we've got today. Um, mainly shopping. <laughs> mainly shopping. We've had everything aboard and we're feeling hungry. So it's time to go to the shops. <laughs>